you're invited to stay seated and to put down your bulletin and just let the words of the gospel wash over you. The Holy Gospel, according to John, the sixth chapter. Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for those who were sick. So Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get just a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in that place. So they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Wow. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also with the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, Jesus told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that Jesus had done, they began to say, this indeed is the prophet who is to come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. The Gospel of our Lord. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Four verses. Four verses dedicated to the story of Bathsheba and David. Over 20 verses dedicated to David's cleaning up the aftermath by killing and and arranging for the death of Uriah the Hittite. Two chapters dealing with this whole story between David and Joab and Nathan the prophet and Bathsheba and Uriah the Hittite. Four verses dedicated to Bathsheba. And we only hear her say one thing, I'm pregnant. How many of you have seen the David and Bathsheba story from, I want to say, the 50s, the movie? I think it was Greta Garbo that was in that one. Is that correct? Beautiful woman. I know it was one of the beautiful Hollywood actresses, and she was bathing on the roof, and King David saw her and burned with lust for her. And, and there, was, there was then this, this story of, of a love affair that had occurred. And um, just like in these verses in Samuel, the focus is on the wrong that David has done to, uh, to Uriah the Hittite. We hear this story through the lens of men because the story was written in a time where patriot, patriot, ugh, not patriotism, a patriarchal society was really prevalent. And one could argue that we still read this story through the li- largely through the lens of 
men, where, where we hear their voices and we hear the hurt done to them. And I find myself wondering, what is the story of Bathsheba? Where is her voice in all of this? We know that David did a great wrong to God by disobeying God's law. We know that David did a, a great wrong to Uriah the Hittite. But what happened to Bathsheba? Because when Nathan comes to David, he gives a story about a man who has many goats, or sheep, goats or sheep, a large flock of sheep, and yet doesn't want to sacrifice one of his sheep for his guest, and so he goes and takes the one sheep from his neighbor. The property of his neighbor, he takes that, so he, he uh, wrongs his male neighbor. But again, we don't hear what happened to Bathsheba. And so let's think about this story again, these four little verses that we have, and think about Bathsheba's story. What we can hear from the story is that Bathsheba has just finished her menstrual cycle, and according to the law, Bathsheba needs to, uh, uh, after seven days rest period, purify herself with a ritual bath so she can be brought back into a state of cleanliness before God and be brought back into the community and into the people. And so that is what she's doing. She is, toward the, uh, toward the evening hours, taking her bath. And these baths tend to be a little bit in the open air, much like I remember taking an afternoon bath when it was really hot in, in the Gambia and having a man who was standing on a stoop say, oh, look, the tubab is bathing. And I said, yes, yes, I know, stop that. <laughs> and so likewise, David see, looks down, and he's not supposed to be there. Bathsheba is actually where she's supposed to be. We don't know exactly if she's Israelite or if she's Hittite, which means one of the outsiders from the land of Canaan. Um, but we do know that her husband is very faithful, so faithful to the ark and to his feather fellow soldiers that he won't even go down when David tries to trap him. He won't even go down to see his wife because he's afraid that he will burn with passion for his wife and he won't be able to stop himself and he'll become ritually unpure and not be able to go back to war and to be with God and the, the soldiers. And, and, and then in their thinking, that could cost them the entire war. And so we know that her husband is faithful. So, and we know that she's probably faithful too, because after all, she is conducting the ritual bath. So we have this, this seemingly faithful woman who is bathing, and then David, who is not in the right place at the right time. At the time when kings go to war, when kings lead their people as a good king should do and shepherd their people, David is no longer with his soldiers. He sends them out to be killed, where he stays on his roof in his luxury. And then he looks down and he sees Bathsheba bathing and he wants her. And so he does what he has the authority and the power to do. He sends his soldiers to, to her. And who knows if they knock or if they just charge in. But you can imagine Bathsheba barely getting her clothes back on her. Just having purified herself and the soldiers coming in and her being probably terrified and wondering, what is going on that the soldiers of the king have come to me? Has something happened to my husband, Uriah the Hittite? Has he done something wrong to displease the king? Have I done something wrong to displease the king? And then they grab her. It says they get her and she comes in our translation. But in the Hebrew, it's they grasp her, they grab her, and they take her to, da to David. And then we have this Nice image, David lays with her. David takes her, he grabs her, he assaults her, let's name it, he rapes her. Even if she didn't put up a fight, it would still be that because he abused his power. Who is going to say no to the king after all? 
What happens if she says no to the king? He could call her for treason. He could kill her. He could harm her husband. So she has literally no choice whether she fought back or not. And then she goes back. This woman who just ritually purified herself, now completely impure. She probably does what women do, or men, when this happens. And she bathes again. Tries to wash herself clean. And then a, few, a couple months go by, and all of a sudden, worse thing comes. She's pregnant. So not only is, is this shame upon her, but now she has this baby growing inside of her. She cannot hide it. And with her husband at war, she will be accused of adultery, and she could be stoned to death. She does the one thing that she can do. She turns to the very man who abused her and says, I'm pregnant. Sends through her shoulders, I'm pregnant. And David knows that, uh uh-oh, I've been caught. These soldiers kind of know what has happened. The word could spread. So David sends for Uriah the Hittite and says, I can cover my tracks. Of course, we know that Uriah, being faithful, does not go down to his wife, even when David conspires to get him drunk. You would think that he'd then go down to his wife, but he doesn't. He sleeps with the soldiers as a faithful, as a man faithful to the soldiers and faithful to God. And so, who knows if Bathsheba heard that her husband was in town? Who knows if she expected him to come? Who knows if David said anything to her? And who knows what she was thinking exactly? But Uriah goes back to war, and then soon, Bathsheba gets the message that Uriah has been killed in war. Does she suspect that David had arranged it? Maybe not, but maybe, because conveniently enough, right after her time of mourning, as soon as he possibly can, David brings her in to get married to him, to become one of his wives, one of his wives. Remember, he has several. Now she's married to the man who assaulted her killed her husband, and got her pregnant. And then their child dies. This woman, this woman has been through a lot of trauma. And over the years and over the centuries, we, just like the early writers, we focused on the stories of the men, and her voice has been silent. It is a sign It is a good sign that women's voices are starting to be heard more and more in our society, that the Me Too movement is really like throwing force behind this and saying, you know what, sexual assault is real and it is wrong, and a lot of women experience it. One in six women experience a rape or an attempted rape. One in four women One in four women experience some kind of sexual assault. One in 33 men, one in 33 men experience rape or or attempted rape. But their voices are largely left unheard. Both the women and the men. Their voices are left unheard. And so we have to take these four verses and we have to try to pull them out and listen to the story and the voice of Bathsheba. And it is hard work, isn't it? It's really hard to hear these stories. We want to dig our head into the sand. Like my friend who finally uh, said to her parents, what, told them what her brother was doing to her, and they just couldn't hear it. And they never did till the end of their lives. They could not hear it. Even when she was the one at the end taking care of them. She offered them forgiveness, but she, they could not admit it. It is a hard conversation to have. Or the man that came to me several years ago, just because he'd heard about me around town and he needed someone to talk to. And he was a man in leadership positions. And he'd had a good life. But he always struggled in his life. 
And he always thought that his abuse in high school from other boys was something, it was somehow maybe his own fault, was somehow he had asked for it. And it was really hard for him to start to see that it wasn't his fault, that he hadn't brought that on himself. And he needed someone to listen to his stories. People are literally dying of depression and of fear and of anxiety and of, of poverty and illness and, and abuse and chronic abuse because we're not listening to their stories, because we're not talking to our children and to each other and saying that this is an epidemic, that we need to, we need to call this for what it is. We need to say that David fell short of being God's anointed at this time, that he was not always perfect and faithful. Yes, he was faithful to God. Yes, he followed God. Yes, God chose him. And yes, he went out and he led the people for years under Saul. And he became king. But something happened to David that happens to many of us. And I say us because it's a human thing. Any idea what it might be? Say it again. Power. Power happened to David. Power in and of itself is not bad. Power is the ability to act. And we might, with, with that's one thing that was taken away from Bathsheba. She never had that, right? But David did. He had the power and the ability to act for good following God or for evil, hurting others, abusing his power, so that his power as king that was supposed to be on behalf of God and in service for the people, as a shepherd to the people, instead he practiced power over the people, sending soldiers where he wants them, sending letters to command Joab, Joab to arrange for the death of someone, taking Bathsheba by force. Power can corrupt. And how on earth do we avoid that? Because we hear it over and over again, and that's what the Me Too movement is trying to say, that we have an epidemic that continues today of people abusing their power against men and against women, right? So we have a doctor that abused many Olympian Olympians and girls. We have a Hollywood director that abused many people. We have an actor whom I grew up loving, Bill Cosby, who abused many people. We have politicians and leaders in our government who say that it was okay because of their positions of authority and leadership to go around groping someone. And when we're silent about it, we contribute to the problem. If we don't listen to people, we contribute to the problem, right? If we say, well, how many of you have heard, well, men will do that? You don't have to raise your hand, but uh, I think many of us have heard that, right? That happens. Boys will be boys. Thank you, Judy. The ELCA social statement on women and justice calls it as it is. That is contributing to what's called a rape culture, a culture that says that it's okay, that it's okay to cross the line, that it's okay that 99% uh, of people who, uh, who, who perpetrate this wrong do not ever get convicted. David is convicted by Nathan, Nathan, right? But then he is offered forgiveness by God, but he still suffers severe consequences. And unfortunately for the people around him, the consequences aren't just for him, right? His child dies. He, chaos runs through his entire family so that the very next story is that one of his sons rapes his half-sister, one of David's daughters, and then the other son, the brother, kills the son that perpetrated the violence. I mean, David's household is a hot mess because turns out when we let power go to our heads 
And when we um, hurt other people, we reap what we sow. And we sow violence. And we sow destruction. But I want to go a little further because there's one, like, couple more, like maybe two more verses of Bathsheba. Two more verses of Bathsheba in the beginning of Kings. We hear when Solomon um, is not supposed to be king, by the way. Solomon is Bathsheba and David's son, and Solomon is um, in the middle child, so he's not supposed to succeed David. But D- uh, Nathan tells Bathsheba, go, go to David and say, remember you promised, and I can't find that anywhere in scripture, but apparently somewhere David promised to Bathsheba that your son Solomon would be king. And so she says, you said my son Solomon will be king. He says, okay. So he makes his son Solomon king when he shouldn't have been king. And then Bathsheba goes to David to, or to Solomon to ask for a favor. She doesn't get the favor, but what she does get is a seat by Solomon's neck, right hand. This woman is still alive. This woman has been a mother. This woman is now seated beside the king. This woman has his ear. This woman has a crown on her head. Doesn't make it all okay, but do we see how this woman is not just a victim? She is a survivor. She is a survivor. Jesus invites us to sit in the green grass. And he gives us food, and he gives us meal, and we call it a sign. And people want a sign from him, and they want more bread, and they want more drink, and they forget. They forget who provided it. They forget that it wasn't about the bread. It was about the promise that God provides. And when we forget who provides and we think that we do it ourselves, that's when power corrupts. So can we, as people, in whatever position of privilege and authority and power we might find ourselves, whether it's with our kids or in a company or in a political sphere or in church, wherever we find ourselves that we have some power and ability to act, can we remember that we do so on behalf of the God who provides for all? And might that keep us just humble enough that power does not corrupt us? Might it give us the courage to listen to people who have been victim and to victims and to sidle up alongside so that we can walk together and be survivors? Survivors that can not just survive but actually thrive together. Can we call our leaders in any position on the carpet when we see them abusing their power? Do we have the courage to say, this is not okay? I tell you right now, if you ever see me abusing my power and authority, call me on the carpet. I'm fine with that. Because you know what? I also believe in God's grace and God's forgiveness. And I know that when we make mistakes and we let power get to our head, we have to suffer the consequences and face them. But we also are given the opportunity to move forward in a different light. That's grace. No one is left behind. Can we create an honest world like that together? I believe that Jesus said we can and that it is here. It is called the reign of God. And it is what we are privileged to be a part of. And so now, children of God, may the peace and love and healing of Christ, which surpasses all human understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in this same Christ Jesus, now and always. Amen.